I want what I want. <laughs> Somebody still on, on track there. I want what I want. You know, we all have wants. We all have wants in life. But actually getting what we want, it can be tricky and sometimes even dangerous. Oh, yeah. And, and the reason it's dangerous is it usually leaves us wanting more and more and more when we get what we want. Am I right or am I right? And if this is true, maybe, just maybe, we want the wrong things. Think about it. So there's a question that's begging to be asked this, this morning. Very simple question. What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? I want you to think about that for a second. Just think about it. I know you don't have much time. Just think for a few seconds. What do you want? You know, the older we get, the less what there is. You know, the younger folks, at every season in our lives, we want something. If I ask a 10-year-old, what do you want? I want a PS5. I want a bike. I want a bicycle. I want toys, toys, toys. Ask a 25-year-old what he wants or she wants. They may tell you, you know, I'm, I'm looking to get married or I want to find purpose for my life, a career path. Ask a 45-year-old who I assume may have had a family by now. And the 45-year-old will tell you, I, I, I want, you know, to, 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 to provide for my family. Amongst other things, right? Ask a 70-year-old who's getting closer. You know, they're getting closer to, to the end right there. You know, no, no offense, daddy. Amen. But, you know, a 70, 80-year-old, they have a different response to this question. So the older you get, the less what there is. But every single one of us at every season of our lives, we always want something. The older folks, they want to do what it takes to stay alive for as long as possible, right? They want to leave a legacy. So we all want something. And the reason this question is very tricky, what do you want? I'll tell you why. Number one reason is this. We want our way. Oh, yeah. You probably did not think of that, but yes, that is true if you're honest with yourself. We want our way. But the interesting thing is as long as you insist on always having your way, a lot of times you actually don't get what you really want. What do I mean? Many times... You see, I want what I want. You want what you want. I want my way. You want your way. And many times if I insist on I must get my way, you know what happens? We actually get in our way. When we get our way all the time, we often get in our way. I want you, and I know we don't have a lot of time to think about these things. This is a practical exercise. But if you think back on your life, there are many times where you got your way. But in the end... You were not satisfied. You know, there were times where you, you cheated to get your way. You kind of pushed through. You bullied your way through. You, you, you stamped, trampled on others to get your way. You, you, you bribed your way through. I don't know how you got it, but you ensured that you got your way. You know, you, you, you won the argument. Everybody else shut up and said, all right, you have your way. And you ended up getting your way. But because you got your way in such a funny way, you were not satisfied. You did not feel fulfilled. If you think about it, I bet you there's been some times in your life like that. So many times when we insist on getting our way, we actually get in our way. There's another reason why this question is very tricky. When I ask you, what do you want? No, the second reason, we want to do what we want to do. Ah, human beings, that's who we are, right? When we have made up our minds, we are set in our ways. No one can thwart us. No one can. It's like, I got to do what I want to do. No one can change me. That's how we are. But here's the thing. If you always do what you want to do, you may, just may, end up where you don't want to be. Oh, yeah, let me give you a good example. I think of my own little son, Isaac, you know. A child, children always tell you, Daddy, do I have to do this? No, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> the truth is, you, we cannot make anybody. Do you know that when you are just, as, as soon as you get this tall, I tell you, baby Isaac, my three-year-old son, when I tell you, you cannot make anybody do anything, Isaac, when we feed him, and you know, we want him to eat all his food, when Isaac has decided he's done eating the food, you know what he does? He keeps the food in his mouth. He's chewing and he doesn't swallow. You see, Isaac swallowed that food. I can get a stick and threaten him. I can scream. I can do whatever I want. He'll cry, but the food will stay in his mouth. He will not swallow it because he doesn't want to get another thing. Does that make sense? So as long as you're a certain age, 
No one can make you do anything. A child can literally lie on the floor and say, I'm not going to school. I won't carry them. Now, God forbid we have those kind of kids in here. Amen. I thank God for the wonderful kids we have who are growing in the fear of the Lord. I know you guys are obedient to your parents, right? You honor your father and mother. You know what's right, right? And, and, and we thank God for the grace to raise up these kids in the fear of the Lord. And, uh, but the, kid, the point I'm trying to make is you can't make anyone do anything. When we want our way, we want our way. You know what we can do, though? If I cannot make someone do something, you know what I can do? We can prevent them from doing something. That's what prisons are for. Think about it. That's what prisons are for. You know what prison is? Prison is, 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 you know, uh, is for people who wanted to do what they wanted to do and did not do what they were supposed to do. So we took them and said, since we cannot make you do what you are supposed to do, we will prevent you from doing that selfish thing that you want to do. That's prison for you. We prevent them. We can keep you from doing certain things, but we can't make you do anything. Hallelujah. So kids, if you tell me, Daddy, do I have to do this? I say, okay, you don't have to, but there's prison. Hallelujah. Uh, that's bad advice. That's not good parenting. <laughs> but I just wanted to make my point straight. And the truth is, when you want to do what you want to do, the truth is, you actually limit your options. You really do. Think about it. Just like you go to jail, then now you're stuck. <laughs> you can't do anything you want to do. You limit your options when you insist of on doing your own thing. Because when somebody else has a better idea, that may open up more options for you. So that's why this question is so tricky. What do you want? Let me give you a third reason why it's tricky. We want perpetual pleasure. Mm. So not only do I want my way, not only do I want to do what I want to do, we want perpetual pleasure. And I know when we see the word pleasure, the first thing a lot of times that goes into our minds is sexual pleasure. But as you know, there's more than sexual pleasure in the world. There's so many other pleasures, right? There's so many different types of pleasures. You know, some folks just love watching TV all day. That's pleasurable. If I can binge on Netflix all day, that's pleasure. If I can play video games all day, that's pleasure to me, right? If I can, you know, eat a lot of food. Some people find pleasure in eating food. They just eat and eat and eat. That's what makes them, gives them pleasure. A lot of folks find pleasure in, you know, taking vacations. That's a good thing. You know, they find pleasure in travel. That's cool. Some people find pleasure in photography, videography. We have some folks on the house, amen. But there's some bad things. Some people find pleasure in indulging in, for example, alcohol and drugs because, you know, they tell you it gets them high. They get on cloud nine. They find pleasure in these things. A lot of us find pleasure in entertainment, sports. I love sports. I love soccer. I love Arsenal. It's an English Premier League team. You know, I love basketball. You know, I love LeBron. Come on. So many of us love, love, love pleasure. We love sports. And recently now, I just became a baseball fan all of a sudden. Hey, man, for those of you in Atlanta, Georgia, come on. Go Braves, somebody. Go Braves. If you don't know who the Braves are, for those of you watching, that's our home-based baseball team we just won the 2021 world series come on somebody those are the braves those are the braves for you i love it let's give them a clap offering i love it so again the point is we all find pleasure in something entertainment whatever it is and the key is this whether you find pleasure in something that is legal or illegal pleasure is addictive i have that on the board which ultimately undermines the pleasure, which is, in the end, not what we really wanted. What am I saying? In other words, you can have so much of a good thing, even a legal good thing, that it eventually loses its pleasure. Even worse, it can control you. You know, many times we have just started off, think about something in your life, you may have started off as a, as a pastime, as something of leisure, but before long, that thing is controlling you. A lot of times kids say, you know, I'll just try this little drug, you know, just for a little fun. Before long, you are controlled by that thing. You are addicted to it. Pleasure always starts off a little bit, but then we want too much of it, and it just gets to be too much. It loses its taste. That's the problem with event, with perpetual pleasure. So something that started off initially as pleasurable, now it's controlling you, and in the end, you don't have what you really wanted in the first place. Do you see where I'm going? So you want something, but in the end, you don't really want it anymore. You're thinking, how can I get out of this? And that is how sin works. 
It starts off by luring you. Oh, just do this thing. It's a little bit of fun. But before long, it's controlling you and it destroys your life. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. That's Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. It starts off as pleasure, but the end is destruction. You got to be careful with perpetual pleasure. So I've given you three reasons why when I ask you what do you want, it's a very tricky question. Number four, I'll give you another reason. We want it now. Uh, That's everybody. I'm a victim. You're a victim. But isn't it true that what we want now is not always what we want later? Think about that. What you want now is not always what you want later. I'll just give you an example. Sometimes I may want a particular car right now. I go buy that car, and guess what? I financed the car for, what, five, seven years, 60 months, 72 months. Now I'm, I'm paying, making payments for this car. Three years down the road, I find another car that, wow, no, this is the car I really want. <laughs> but I'm stuck. I can't get that car because I'm stuck with payments. I'm on only on my third year. Because now I've realized this is not really what I wanted. So what I wanted at the time, I don't want it at this other time. And that's just one example. And you know what? What we want today often ends up in our way of what we want tomorrow. Do you know what I'm saying? So what you get today literally prevents you from what you got to get tomorrow. If this, you see this true with relationships. You know, you, you're with this guy or this girl and you just, you're so excited about them, you know, and, and you're just like, this is the guy I want. And you rush into this thing and before long, you know, you get married, for example, and in that marriage, you're in, a, in an abusive marriage and you're stuck. And now you find that there's another guy that you think would have been a better guy for you, but now you're married. So what you wanted at that time has prevented you from getting what you wanted later. Be careful what you want. Be careful what you want. Let me give you the fifth and last reason why this question is so tricky. What do I want? Doesn't regret always begin with I want? Think about it. Every time you regret, it started off with I want, I want, I want this. Then you get it. Then you say, oh my gosh, I wish I didn't get this. It starts, regret starts with I want. And regret ends with, I want to go back in time and not get what I wanted. Come on, somebody. I want to go back in time and not sign that lease. I want to go back in time and not move my family to that new location and get that new job because now it has destroyed my family. I want to go back in time and tell those friends, I don't want to be your friends anymore because you've been a bad influence in my life. I want to go back in time. It started with, I want to be your friend. I want to sign this lease. I want to have that relationship. But now it ends in regret regret. Be careful what you want. For those of you who may have been taking notes, let me kind of help you. Let's do a quick recap. All right. What do you want? Very quickly on the board it says, we want our way. We want to do what we want to do. We want perpetual pleasure. You can take a screenshot if you want. We want it now. And we want to go back in time and not get what we wanted. And that's regret. Amen, somebody. So now that we have established all of this, I want to ask you again, what do you want? Are you able to answer that question this time? I bet it's still tough. (laughs) I don't think you know what you want. Do you know what you want? Probably not, but that's all right. I tell you what, do you know something? Let me say one other thing that's very powerful. Do you know that if we all get what we want, we will not need each other? If I just think of something and I have it, you ha- think of something and you have it. If we all get what we want, I won't need you. Because if I need something, I don't, go to, I don't need to go ask you. I'll just get it. Because I want it. What's the world going to become? Where no one talks to anyone. And if, and if you know what God is about, he's all, the foundation of God is all about relationships. When he made you and I, he wanted to have a family. He wanted to have a relationship with you. If you have all you want... You don't need God. You don't need anybody because I got everything I want. Really, that's hell. Hell is when you get everything. In hell, everybody in hell wants what they want. (laughs) So, brethren, we've got to be careful about this question. James. James, for those of you watching who may not know who James is, James, the one who wrote the book of James in the New Testament of the Bible. James was the brother of Jesus, right? As you know, Jesus was born in an immaculate birth, uh, you know, a special conception. His, his mother Mary did not know a man. This was the Holy Spirit's doing. But after Jesus was born, Mary and her husband had some other kids. And one of them was 
called James. So James, I can assume, he was not much far from age from Jesus. Now, Jesus was the firstborn and the others were younger. But it's interesting that I don't see James throughout Jesus' life in the Bible. We don't, we don't see it uh, throughout his ministry. We don't hear about James. But that sort of actually makes sense, right? If, if I'm James, Jesus' brother, you know, I grew up with this young guy and, and our father is a carpenter and I'm working in the shop every, as we grow up and I'm, we're building chairs and tables for the folks in the neighborhood. And then all of a sudden, this my brother says he's the son of God. He says me and the father are one. I'm thinking to myself, what? <laughs> what are you talking about here, boy? So James, I can understand, didn't believe in Jesus. But here's the turning point. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he went into that grave and he rose from the dead, that was the turning point for James. James, for the first time, called him. He said, my brother, you are my Lord. Oh, and this is the beauty. If you're watching with us, if you've always wondered about this movement, Christianity. See, the Bible says, without the resurrection, our preaching is in vain. My talking up here is just a waste of time. I'm like a loud symbol if there was no resurrection. We believe in Jesus because he resurrected from the dead. That is what sets him apart from every other God. This has to be a no-brainer. Every other God, every other religious leader, they told us things, but they're dead and in the grave. Jesus predicted the only person on earth who predicted his death. It is documented. It's historical. It's archaic. It's, it's there. It's proven. He, 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 he prophesied his own death. It happened exactly as he said, and he rose from the dead. He is not in the grave. He is alive. Why will I not believe that he truly is the way, the truth, and the life? This has to be a no-brainer if you're watching this. And folks, there are witnesses who watched him 40 plus go up in the sky. And he says, the way I go, that same way I will come back. So it behooves you to be ready. Don't be like the ten the virgins who had, whose lambs had no oil. Be ready when Jesus comes again. He's coming back anytime soon. And we see the signs left and right. Wars and rumors of wars. People hating each other. Left and right. Killing. All this stuff. These are signs. And even if he doesn't come in your time, you will go meet him when you die. It is appointed for every man of us. Everyone to die. And then there's judgment. What are you going to tell God in heaven? When, when he asks you, say, what did you want? You're going to say, I wanted my own way. Can I encourage you if you don't do your own research and if right now you want to make that decision here's a quick thing it's, it's not that complicated just say a prayer right now with me say heavenly father jesus christ i acknowledge that you died on the cross for me thank you that you died to forgive my sins i ask that you come into my life transform me and make me into the person into the boy the girl the man the woman that you designed me to be in jesus name amen, amen. if you said that prayer from your heart Welcome into the kingdom of God. It's that easy. And the only thing I can tell you is find a believing church. It's not just one thing you do. Find a place where you can grow. And hey, the doors of this church are open. If you're down here in Atlanta, come to New Life Fellowship. Find us on nlfglobal.org. But let's get back to the word. So James, the turning point in his life was when Jesus came back to life. So James became a pillar. He became a leader in the first century church. And James wrote the book of James where we have so many wonderful nuggets. This morning, I'm going to read to you one of them. James chapter 4 verse 1. It is written. Say amen. amen. I love it. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? That word causes. What's the origin? What's the source? Do you know what David, uh, James said it was? The thing that you want. The thing that you want is what causes it. Let me read the verse. What causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes it? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Yeah, those things that I want within me. I want people to act a certain way. I want people to respond a certain way. I want so many things. I want my way. That thing within me. James says that is the source of your problems. Marital problems, relationship problems. I want this, you want that. Somebody ends up not getting what they want. James says that's why there's conflict. That's why there's quarreling. That's why there are fights. Nation against nation. Wars and wars and rumors of wars in the world today. Vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I want this, you want that. We fight. James says it's because I want and you want and somebody's not getting what they want. James told us. But my question to you this morning is, what does God want? Have you ever thought, what does God want? I'll get back to that eventually. And you may say, Pastor, you know, it's not that I don't get, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I deserve from this relationship. 
It's not even about the wants. I'm not getting what I deserve. But isn't it true that you want what you think you deserve? I'm playing around with words here. Yeah, yeah. You want what you think you deserve. So either way, James is right. Let me give you an example. I had a job before the job I have right now that I believed I deserved to be paid more. And I made requests, give me a raise, and they didn't give me my raise. And, you know, throughout all of this, I have learned a big lesson. You know, in everything you see, God, we're in a month of Thanksgiving. God expects us to be grateful for what we have now while we work hard for what we'll get later. But be thankful for what you have now. Can I get an amen, somebody? See, I, if we complain and say, God, but I deserve a raise. Who told you you deserve a raise? Just because I've worked hard, I, I got it. Yeah, you know, you deserve. But God, see, brethren, if we have a heart that is grateful. See, God is looking for folks who are grateful. And I tell you, I, so I applied to so many other jobs. There was some that I really wanted. I really wanted, but I didn't get them. I applied for about two years trying to get another job. But eventually I landed on a job I have now that I love. And I believe this job is perfect for me. Amen, somebody. That's a testimony. And, and this job is fulfilling. It pays me right. I finally get what I deserve, I guess. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the point is, wait on God. His time is best. You know, can I share something? No, I'll share with you guys later. But the thing is, look, we have to trust God. James, let me read verse 2. James chapter 4, verse 2. He says, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. My gosh. Now, that may seem like a hyperbole or an exaggeration, but that's real. You kill. You covet because you cannot, uh, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. I ask you, what does God want? You know, that word kill, I want to just speak about that real quickly. And that seems so harsh, but think about it. Have you ever seen people in a relationship, you know, especially folks who are dating, they're not married yet. And, 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 and one of them is he's just fighting for that thing to happen to death. Like they're fighting to death that we must get married. I'm just using an example. It's an easy example. And it usually happens with the ladies because, you know, folks, the men have to ask them to marry them. For the men, it's easy. They can just go ask anyone. But the ladies have to wait. So it's this pressure on the ladies, and I don't blame them, you know. But what happens is you may have a relationship, and the lady's like pressuring this guy to marry her, you know. She's like wanting that marriage to death, and then she eventually drives the man away. So that's what that killing is there. Let me give you another example. Many people kill opportunities because of their wants and their desires. Just look at even ministers, even pastors of these large mega churches. You've seen men who started off really well, but then their wants, those lustful desires, push them to go sleeping around with women in their church, and bam, the scandal is exposed, and the ministry comes crumbling down. Not only in the churches, you see the political leaders, you see athletes, you see the, 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 the you know, this great movie stars and whatever they start off really well they have great opportunities but their lustful wants and desires they they, they they kill those opportunities by doing the wrong thing succumbing to that lust and destroying their careers just recently i watched the news of a football player who went ahead and got drunk dui and he hit somebody a 21 year old girl she was an african actually and killed this girl Look at what you've done to somebody's family. This is a guy playing in the NFL who has everything, but he can't control himself. He goes out drinking, gets drunk. You can hire a driver, but no, he gets behind the wheel, and he was going 156 miles an hour, 165 miles an hour, and killed a 21-year-old girl. And now he's facing 40 years in jail. He has killed his opportunity because of his wants and desires and killed somebody else's ch child. So James is telling us that if you don't get things under control, if you don't harness what's beneath this question of what do I want, we all have the potential to kill what we or what's most important to us. Think about how you answer that question, what do I want? Let me summarize to you very briefly in two sentences what we've said so far for the last 20 minutes. Number one, getting what we want can be a problem. Have we established that? I give you five reasons why. Now James comes and says, not only is getting what we want a problem, James is saying not getting what we want can also be a problem because it causes conflict. When I don't get my way, I'm in conflict. So if I get my way, I don't get my way, problems, problems. Pastor, what do we do? Thank you for asking. If you thought this message was about 
how to get what you really want, obviously you were mistaken. Can I get an amen? <laughs> This question is not about, this, this sermon is not about how to get what you really want. In other words, in fact, I'm here to tell you, you should not get what you want. That's my message. You don't get what you want. And this is something that you have to figure out on your own. This is not something someone else will figure out for you. Brethren, no one, there's no place in this world. See, most of us do not know what we need uh, because we are so distracted by what we want. Let me rephrase that. I'm filling that gap you see there. Most of us don't know what we need. In other words, we don't know what we really want because we are so distracted by what we want. There's a difference. I added the word really because if you sit back and think about what really matters in life, it'll change how you answer that question. What you need, what you really want is what matters. There's no place in this world that's going to tell you how to answer this question. The only place is in the Bible. It's in the word of God. And I'm going to prove it to you this morning. There's nothing in this world. In this world, the commercials you see on TV that tell you what you think you need, no, they're, they're satisfying your wants. I'll just tell you that right now. You have to take time to figure this out. And it starts with a relationship with God. And I know that may sound vague and you're saying, okay, a relationship with God, pastor, that doesn't make much sense. Don't worry, we'll explain it to you as we keep, just, just stay with me. Can, I, can you stay with me this morning? Yeah. Amen. What we need waits in a realm that we rarely explore. What we need waits in a realm, Gabby, that we rarely explore. That's the spiritual realm, if you hadn't guessed by now. In this natural realm, you'll never get what you want. It'll never end up, it'll never end up well. I've made, I hope I've made that clear to us. I'll spend the last 20 minutes telling you that we have, we've all had experience of getting what we naturally wanted. Only to discover that it was not what was most valuable. What is most valuable is supernatural. And I will prove it to you by the grace of God this morning. Choosing what's valuable is not natural. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It is difficult, not only because you lack information or, or you lack uh, uh, discipline. Information is right there. The Bible is right there. The folks who read the Bible, but they don't change, uh, you know, discipline. The folks who've tried to be disciplined, but it still doesn't work. That's why Paul said, I tried and I tried and I couldn't do it. See, when you find, you see, there's, there's, there's a battle between what I, I naturally want and what's valuable for me. These two are fighting each other, fighting each other. Right? And, when, and when you can finally break through that conflict. Everything in your life changes. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. This is Paul speaking, a guy who wrote half the New Testament. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want, there's the want again. <laughs> what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. If you're honest with yourself, you know this is true in your own life. There are things you've done and you look back and say, man, I hate that. Some of us have done so many things that we actually hate so much that we are starting to hate our own selves. But if you're like that, please, I want to preach to you this morning. There is good news. Don't hate yourself in Jesus' name. Yes, you may hate the things you did. That's all right. But never hate yourself. God loves you. And he wants to turn things around for you. In Jesus' name. Verse 16 of Romans 7, uh, 7, Paul says, And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, I know what's right. The law tells me this is good, and still I don't do it. Verse 17. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Now we're getting there, we're getting there. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. Whoa, good does not dwell in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That sinful nature is the same thing as the natural. I told you your answer is not in the natural. It is in the supernatural. The natural is sinful. That's why you don't do the things you really want to do. The point of this message, let me tell you something. There's something wrong with you. If I had to re retitle this message, instead of saying I want what I want, I may have given the title of this message, There's Something Wrong With You. Yeah, there's something wrong with you. You're like, well, Pastor, ain't nothing wrong with me. Yeah, there's something wrong with you. And if it makes you feel any better, there is something wrong with me too. There's something wrong with all of us. You know what's wrong with us? Human nature. You know what's wrong with us? The sinful nature. It's in you. It really is. Even as a child of God, sadly, it's still there. 
but there's good news this morning. That human nature, you know, the things it does, the thing, the cheating that you do, the lying, the racism, the adultery, the me first, the revenge, all those things, those are attributes of that sinful nature, that natural man, that nature in you. That's why I told you the, the, the solution to your problem is not natural, it's supernatural. What's most valuable is not natural, it's supernatural. Let me make this picture really clear. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 from the New Living Translation says, When you follow the desires or the wants, it's on the screen. When you follow the desires and the wants of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. <laughs> Every time you do what you selfishly want, the results are very clear. We've established that. Verse 19 still says, this is what they are. Sexual immorality. Do we see that today? Impurity. Lustful pleasures. We talked about that. Idolatry. Idolatry is putting things before God. But you know what I've come to realize? Idolatry is also putting things before men. Think about it. If I have something and I say, let me give a good example of a car. I have a Durango and a Camry. If I say, you know what, if somebody wants to borrow my car, they can only borrow the Camry. They can't touch the Durango because it's my special car. You know what I just did? I just made the Durango an idol. Think about this. This is the thing that nobody should touch. This is a chair in the house nobody should sit on because it's my special chair. This is a thing that's mine. No other man should touch it except me because I worship it. You think that thing is so great that nobody else can borrow it. That thing is slightly becoming an idol. Anything you put before God and even when you put things before men, we are to give everything away. It doesn't matter what it is. There's nothing that as valuable as you think that somebody else cannot have that you have. Can I get an amen somebody? Don't create idols and leave idols around your house. Give things away. Idolatry, sorcery. You may think, oh, this is abstract. I'm not a witch. I'm not a witch. I'm not a wizard. Do you know, what is sorcery? Try to control people. When you try to control others, that's witchcraft. <laughs> Amen. Sorcery is witchcraft. Witches try to control people. When you are so controlling, that is sorcery. Let's get real. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy. Jealousy because of comparison. How many times have you celebrated the demise of somebody else? When you see somebody struggling, somehow there's something you just say, ah, that's good. Wow. Yeah, you deserve it. You see somebody after many years and you see them and they've gotten, they've put on a few pounds. And in the inside of you, are kind of happy. Oh, look at how fat she is. Thank God I'm not the only fat person. There's another fat one. Jealousy. Evil. Outbursts of anger. Selfish ambition. We talked about it. I want my way. I got to have my way. Dissension. Division. Envy. Drunkenness. We all know someone in our families who, who may be struggling with drinking and getting drunk. And, and they've told you they want to quit, but it's just so hard. This is what the world does. This is what the nature does. Wild parties. Ah, that's, that's the new thing nowadays. Lots of wild parties. Orgies. And there's so many that the Bible just says, I'm just going to say, and other sins like these. Paul says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Plain and simple. This is a tough battle, I know, brethren. But the good news, the good news is that in this battle, you can win in Christ. Somebody say amen. You can and you will win. You have already won. If you can claim the division. Can we just declare this morning? Let's declare. Say, I am a winner. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. I am more than a conqueror. Give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Amen. Let's use our mouths to speak life. James 1.14 says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when the sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. I told you there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. This is how it works. You know, you say things like, I wanted to do what God wanted for me, but that friend came and dragged me away, dragged away. 
back to the world. I wanted to do what God wanted for me. But that new opportunity, that new job dragged me away. Now I never come to church. I'm so busy working. I wanted what God wanted for me. But that old habit came and dragged me away. Dragged me back to the world. God forbid in Jesus' name. Verse 16, James says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by that new opportunity that looks so good. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift, something may seem good, but if it's not from the Father of lights, it is bad. He says, the good things, the perfect things, the wholesome things are from the Father above. He's the Father, the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. It's the Bible. It's supernatural. That's your solution. That we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Bread don't trade ultimate for immediate. See, many of us want things now, but then later we find out this is what. There's an ultimate plan that God wants for you. Your desire should be the ultimate, the end in sight. Don't trade ultimate, which is the good gift of God, for immediate, which is your selfish desire. Don't trade valuable for natural. You know, there's a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, it's a book that has been read by so many Americans, about 40 million, as it says on there, and, and counting. And I happen to have read that book, right? And uh, there's something in this book that I want to point out. The writer of this book, at some point, he said he wanted to give us the funeral experience. And he says, I want you to think of yourself, think that in three years you're going to die. And, and, and in your mind's eye, place yourself at your funeral, Right, so you're at your funeral, you're there, you're watching people talk and talk and talk about you and you're listening and thinking, whoa, so is this what they really thought about me? Or are they just lying and making these things up because I'm dead? You know, you know, you know what you did, you know how your life was. And so a lot of times we say good things at people's funerals just because we want to respect them. But the truth is, a lot of those people who died, some of them have some really bad lives, but we just don't want to say them. But this guy is saying, you know, just picture yourself watching your own funeral. And it's an interesting exercise. Now, this is not necessarily a Christian book, but as you know, we encourage people in this church, read your Bible, read Christian literature, but there are also lots of good books out there that you've got to read. That's why we go to school, right? We read stuff. It's not necessarily Christian, but we do it, you know, to, 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 do, to live in this life. And I recommend this book. Now, I'll say this. There was one thing he said in that book. He said, after he said you had that experience, he said, if you carefully consider what you wanted to be said in the funeral experience, you will find your definition of success. In other words, he's saying if you really do this exercise genuinely, you will find that there are many things that you wanted to be said about you at your funeral that are not really aligned to your desires right now. Right now, you just want things, you just want things, you care about yourself, you care about yourself. In this book, he's pretty much telling us that success has nothing to do with accomplishments. He's saying success has everything to do with my character and how I treat others. Somebody say amen. I don't even know if this guy's a Christian. But as a believer, speaking of success, I want, you, I want to leave you with this. Let sin become synonymous with failure. The Bible says hate sin. The Bible says hate every appearance of sin. Let sin in your life be synonymous to failure. In other words, when you do something wrong, you're like, boy, I failed. Yes, that's the level we need to go. And owning up, owning up to your sin, to your failure, is actually success because at that point, it puts you in a position to be able to repent, right? And ask for forgiveness. So it's two ways. Let sin be failure. That's your definition of failure. Success is living for Christ. And by the way, if you want to join us, you want to know what those seven habits are, because I know you're thinking, is Pastor going to tell us? I'm not going to tell you. If you want to know what those are, read the book, or you can join us on our Bible study on Wednesdays, all right? So if you're online, I want to give you, it's going to be fun. Uh, we'll quickly go through those seven things. Uh, you know, on, on Wednesday, 7 p.m., it's via Zoom. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, let me just give you an idea. Let me give you a taste of what those seven habits are. He says, number one, be proactive. In other words, take initiative. Go the extra mile. Number two, Begin with the end in mind. Always think about the end, not just the now, right? Uh, he talks about putting first things first. I told you, uh, you know, the things, put God first. Can I just say something, brethren? To get what you really want, you must discover what you really value. Let me say that again. If you want to understand what you really want in life, you have to understand what you really value. Let me give you an example from my own life. I value progress. That's a good thing, right? But you know what? I also value integrity. Now, if I'm going to get progress at the expense of integrity, 
That's failure. Amen, somebody. Progress at the expense of integrity is failure for me. Progress is not bad, but there's a priority. Something is better. I had a conversation with my daddy. We were talking about something the other day, and we were talking about, you know, we have money to renovate our church, you know, and the truth is we owe it to those who have been giving to do that job, and we'll try to make, by God's grace, every effort to make sure this, this, this project comes to pass. But I told him, and we were talking about this, and we said, look, now, if something happens and there's a ridiculous emergency in the house, guess what? We will get money from there and take care of people. Because at the end of the day, we're renovating a church. This is a building. It's going to burn down one day. People's lives matter better. Does that make sense? Priorities. What's most important at the time? God can still provide. Do you understand? So in your own life, you need to have things that you consider valuable. And this is an exercise you have to do. Nobody can do this for you. You have to understand what's most valuable so you can prioritize and say, you know what? Even if these are two good things, what's the better thing to do right now? Yeah. I was telling you the seven things begin with the end in mind. Put first things first. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Yeah. Putting others first. Esteeming others more highly than yourself. This guy gets it from the Bible. Synergize. That's a big word for teamwork. Two are better than one. That's from the Bible. And finally, sharpen the saw. I love that one. This guy talks about if you give him a tree to cut down and you give him three hours to cut down the tree and you give him a saw, he's going to spend two hours sharpening the saw and then five minutes to cut down the tree. Amen, somebody. Did you catch that? Priorities. If you take a bad saw and you're cutting that tree, it will take you 10 hours. He says, I'll take two hours to sharpen my saw and then I'll cut the tree in three minutes. It's a great book. I recommend it. But let me read something. So let's go back to our message. What's the real question this morning? It's not what do you want. The question is, what does God want from me? What does God want for me? Who? There's a from and a for. You know what God wants from you? Many things, but I'll tell you this. He wants surrender. He wants obedience. He wants you to trust him. But you know what God wants for you? Do you know that if you think about every good parent, every good parent does what? They want more for their children than they want from them. It's the bad parents who want to use their children to live vicariously through their children and all that. But a good parent just wants to give into their kids, right? I want my kids to be better than me. You know, they give all they've got. Good parents want more for their children than from. God is the same way. God wants some stuff from us, yes, but the stuff from us is so easy. Obedience, surrender, trust. <laughs> it's not, but God, in, 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 he wants so much more for you. That's why he gave his all on the cross. He gave his own life for you. He gave it all. God wants to bless you. He wants to bring fulfillment in your life. Every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights. He wants what's best for you. And many times we think that the, 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 my life, God blesses me only through material things. That's one way, but material things are not the end or be all. Solomon can tell you that. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. God can bring fulfillment in your life even if you have little. What matters, what you, that's why you've got to discover what you value most. If you value lots of money, the Bible says it's going to be harder for a rich man to get into heaven than to go through, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So when I tell people who value, who want so much money in life, you need extra grace. I know we all love to be rich, but do you know that when you are very rich, and that's why I, when I see rich people serving God, I'm blessed by that. Because when you're very rich, you're more likely to go to hell. I'll tell you right now, many of us want so much money. Jesus said, if you get so much money, you're so rich, it is harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's pretty much impossible. He's literally saying you're going to go to hell because when you have so much money, you end up thinking you don't need God. You don't need anybody else. I have what I need and you forget God. Even if you don't do it intentionally, subconsciously, that natural man will just move away from God slowly and slowly until you're far away. And then you end up in destruction. So when you desire wealth, you better desire wealth for the right reasons. To bless others. To bless others. To bless the kingdom of God. Hallelujah, somebody. What do you want? We should be like God. We are made in his image. We should imitate God. What God wants for you is blessings. He wants you to behave the same way. 
when I ask you, what do you want? Many of us want things for ourselves. God is saying, I want you to want things for others. Hallelujah. When I ask you that question, you should say, what is it? I want something for others, not from others. We always want things from people, expect things from people, expectations here and there. What do you want for them? Forget about what you want from them. Even if they don't give you what you want, give them what they should get. It's mercy. It's grace. That's what God gave you. Give the same grace to others. Don't only think about yourself. If you answer that question about yourself, you've answered the question wrong. And you go through all what we just talked about. And many of us who don't believe in Christ, we think that surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. When I say, God, what, what does he want from you? He wants surrender. Many people think when they surrender to God, they surrender happiness, they surrender fulfillment. That's so far from the truth. Since when did God become such a bad person that when you surrender to him, he takes away enjoyment in your life? You can enjoy life as a child of God. Amen. You just need somebody to help guide you, show you how to enjoy it if, if you don't know. Amen. Amen. I'm enjoying my life. And I'm a child of God. And I'm not ashamed of it. And you'll never find me in those orgies or wild parties. God forbid in Jesus' name. What does God want for me? Let's close our message this morning, brethren. If there was a way for God to, to impose upon our will, I believe God would do what it said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And we're close to the end. I just read to you Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. It talks about sin and sin and sin. But here's the good news. It's not all bad. The good news is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, here's what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit, Spirit again, spiritual realm, the realm that we really explore, that's where your answer is. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Let me just stop. Just stop. Just stop. Those three right there, can solve all the problems in the world. Think about it. If I love the unlovable, do I need to fight them? No. If I love the difficult people, do I need to fight them? No. Uh, joy. Even in trials, I'm joyful. What more is there? Is there a problem? No. Uh, peace. Contentment. If I'm content with what I have right now, while I'm trusting God for more in the future, no problem. But if I'm content at all times, do I have a problem? No. Those three right there <laughs> solves all your problems. But let's keep going. Kindness. Patience. Thank you, Auntie Marilyn. Patience. That's our problem. We want things now instead of later. Patience. It solves that problem. Kindness. Kindness does not impede progress. Kindness does not prevent progress. Do you know what the world is today? Is any man for himself. God for us all. Which is not, it's not biblical. Everybody in the world today is fighting for themselves. It's a hustle and bustle. People trample on others to get their ways. People cheat still to get their way. That's not kind. Let me do something. Let me tell you something that I don't believe any of us has done here. Have you ever prayed a kind prayer? Let me tell you what a kind prayer is. And I almost bet no one has done this. When you apply for a job, have you ever prayed after you apply for that job and say, God, if there's somebody else who needs this job more than I do, give it to them. Amen. If you've ever prayed that prayer, lift up your hand. I want to see. I don't think anybody has ever done that. That is kindness. That is kindness. See, the world today says, I, will, I have to win. I have to get the job. Do you realize that when you get that job, somebody else has not gotten the job? Many times you complain that, God, why am I not getting this? But why don't you thank God that somebody else got that job? That person right now is rejoicing and they're blessed. You don't know what that person is going through. They may have 20 kids and they don't have any food. And you wanted that job so bad, but God gave it to that person because they had a greater need. Have you ever sat back and, and that person is giving a testimony in church somewhere, but you are in your house complaining that God doesn't love me. Is it the same God we serve? If we get to a point where we are kind, even in our prayers... God, give this to this person who needs it more. If you do it not just like a formula or trick to trick God, if you are genuine about it, I know my God. He's a good God. God will see that attitude and say, what? Take my son. Here's a better job for you. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm passionate this morning. Can we rise up? Can we rise up? We're done. Goodness, faithfulness, be committed to something. Gentleness, this solves our problems. Self-control. Control that desire within. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ. I've told you you've got to come to Christ. It's a spiritual affair. 
They have crucified the flesh, crucified its passions and desires. That I want, I want, I want. I crucify that flesh. Amen. My wants don't have power over me. You have to be intentional. I am no longer a slave to verses 19 and 20. I am a slave to verses 22 and 23. Somebody shout amen. amen. I am no longer a slave to sin. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. I am a slave to Jesus. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Amen. The fruit of the spirit is my portion and this fruit will grow in me in Jesus name. Amen. The Bible tells us to renew our minds out with the old and in with the new the old way is what i naturally want the new way gabby the new way is what i ultimately want the old way is what i naturally want the new way i ultimately want what i want now is the old god says renew your mind now what i want is what is god wants for me later on what i want for myself is the old what god wants for me and what i want for others that's the new in the old, I wanted things, things, things. Vanity of vanity. In the new mindset, it's all about character, character, character. The fruit of the Spirit. In the old, I believed lies. In the new, I believe the truth of God's Word. God's Word is true. All God needs from you is obedience. Let's close our eyes and pray this morning. Say, Heavenly Father... Out with the old, in with the new. Father, I no longer want what I want. I'll say it again. Father, I no longer want what I want. But I want what you want. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Let's give the Lord a clap.